Welcome to Coffee and Conversation with Hampton 3 Gallery. I'm Luke Delello, the curator here, and today we're going to talk about our show with Tom Stanley, recently retired from Winthrop. How you doing, Tom? I'm fine, thank you. How long have you been with us? That's a good question. I, I think it's been, gosh, 10, 12 years, maybe longer, and I don't know how that happened, but it did happen. I was happy it did. So this show is pretty varied in subject, but not in time frame, because it's about two years is the distance between the first and last, right? That's and true, yeah. The work done in 2021 or 22 may have been done in Rock Hill. The last works, I'd, in fact, that I did before leaving South Carolina, and then uh, everything else was done in Durham, new studio space as well. So the idea of, of all of those factors encouraged me to think about how my environment changed the work. So you have to begin to develop studio space so you can work. Then the rest of the work was done in that new studio space. It's not all the work that was done in that studio space, but it, it does represent a transitional work. What would you say the, the main differences are between your Rock Hill and your Durham studios? The Rock Hill studio was in an attic, so I, I had to... If it was cold, I had to go up and turn the heater on in advance of going to work and vice versa if it was hot. so But the uh, studio in, in Durham is on a ground level, all of it, and I have a space where it's, it's like an office, I store a lot of work, and then the other half of it is in a converted garage, which I you know tried to insulate. and So it's a great space in which to work. Yeah, I love the windows in your new studio that face the street. Because it's kind of a basement, but it's so bright compared to what you would think. Yeah. Well, those those windows, you know, they're in the garage door, but I mean, that's where I wanted them at the top for two reasons. First of all, so people couldn't walk up and look in, and then I wanted windows. How do you feel like Durham has effectively changed your work, or your work has evolved based on that new space? All I can say is how the space is organized and and where your tools are and how you feel about taking risk all have something to play in that. So, I, you know, the work, the last work that I did in Rock Hill are these tree paintings on the wall, and there's an element of precision in them, and then, of course, these so-called natural tree silhouettes. Those are the last pieces I did in uh, Rock Hill. I did these drawings on paper in Rock Hill before those, but they were all done in the studio upstairs. And then in the new studio... There's a couple transitional pieces there. And then these four larger pieces, two were also, I looked at them as studies. I didn't know where I was going at that time, but they still were making use of this very mechanical line and shapes that had been important to my work for a long time. And so it comes from my interest in mechanical drawing, which is something I've had an interest in for an extremely long time since I was in high school. You know, and I can't deny it, but I, I you know, I wanted to keep evolving see what it was like not to rely on that as much. Because sometimes I use a particular technique or approach to making so much that you want to try something else. Talk about Mr. Lentz for a second while we're on the topic of mechanical drawing. Well, Mr. Lentz was uh, my high school mechanical drawing teacher. And I took mechanical drawing from him as well as architectural drawing. But they were both, you know, based upon things like T-squares and triangles. I mean, the actual tools compasses, sharp lines, different lead weights, things of that nature in order to produce these mechanical type drawings by hand as opposed to on your computer. And so that was um, essentially my only art class in high school. And it was an important part of what I was interested in at that time. But it's always stayed in the techniques and in the information I know how I can make something. So it's always been part of that process. But I wanted to try something else. So for some reason, you know, I, in this period of transition in Durham, I started thinking about some things from my past, which I had tried to avoid for a long time, because a lot of my, a lot of my work previously had been kind of related to my mythical bio story. I think everyone wants to have a mythical biography. They want to be special in some way. So I had probably developed one in my head, and you know, it was based somewhere in my little southern town. I just didn't want to rely upon that any longer. Do that particular work that was just based upon these mechanical lines and shapes. 
And I started thinking about Mr. Lentz, my high school teacher, and I started researching him. And it appeared that he had passed away in Concord in the, uh, like, 2001. And so it was too late to say thank you, Mr. Lentz. <laughs> so, uh, so I did these four small paintings, and I realized as I was doing it, that was what I was thinking about. And so that's why there are four drawings for Mr. Lentz. Yeah, you talk about the, the mythical bio story. That's something that a lot of Southern artists deal with, sort of the history of the South, his, their own personal connection to the South's history. Mm-hmm. I really knew your work from the Mississippi paintings that looked like dripping mud, referencing, it was, was it your grandfather? or? Well, there was some paintings maybe called Across the River. Yes. Yeah, those were done in before the turn of the century. Yeah. And so there I was referencing some research I had done about my grandfather, who was lived in New Orleans and met his demise in the Mississippi River in, you know, 1920 and was found floating at the head of Harmony Street <laughs> three days later. So, you know, there's no photograph of the man. But nonetheless, a, a lot of the things I had done at that time were related to that idea of the Cross River. And, and there was, as you say, there was a lot of dripping mm-hmm. in those, and I had a particular process I was working on that I had painted and I sprayed the canvases so there would be a drip quality to it and I did a lot of work like that for a while there was a lot of medium involved in it so it would stabilize until one day the ceramics (coughs) person faculty member below me in the studio below me said why is all this brownish water coming down my wall in the studio and I said "Uh oh (laughs) and I thought Wow, I will look into that. So anyway, yeah, that was you know, the nature of that. But yeah, there's there's always been some element of, of that. But I wanted not to rely on that. Any right, longer. when we when we talked about this show, you were talking about really leaving from that and not really thinking about that. Well, trying not to as much or rely on it becomes kind of a good excuse. So, and I think there's a, you mentioned the Southern idea. I think there's a certain, everyone has a, a desire to be connected to a Southern Gothic novel. But, you know, that's not necessarily the case. <laughs> and so it's called Uncharted Water. Why is that? That is a good question. You, No one has ever asked me that before. I was thinking about a title for the series because I do work in series. Consciously or unconsciously, there's an element of water involved in these paintings as well. Because they also relied upon that same dripping type of technique or also even using a squirt bottle to paint with. Not having paint in it, but water in it to take away areas of paint. So that was one part of it. And I think, too, I saw elements of uh, that kind of mystical water in a lot of these as I began to make them. And so there's uh, still this idea of journey, and journey has been a part of a lot of my work. I think back to uh, a series called En Route to Hamlet. Hamlet, Louisiana, right? No. Oops. <laughs> North Carolina. Oh, okay. Because Hamlet, North Carolina, is the birthplace of John Coltrane. Mm-hmm. You know, the guy, and also, when I was growing up, if you were en route to Hamlet, you had to go through or pass by, you know, the old wall a mill that had kudzu growing over it, you know, and that was in like, Rockingham, uh, close to the Motor Speedway. And it was remains of a textile mill that burned from the 19th century that had been destroyed. And all that left was this three-story brick wall with arched windows. So it almost looked like an aqueduct. You know, it looked like a mythical piece of architecture in the middle of a North Carolina four-lane highway. So these ideas have been part of journey. And then with a series called Floating, which were ships, I was really interested in that idea of ship. I had just visited New Orleans to do some research, and I started doing these ships, and they were all the same size. I tried to create them so that there was some sort of folk art consistency to them or commercial consistency, but they were all boats and ships. And I got the idea of ships from riding up and down the Mississippi tour boat and realized the huge ships that were in New Orleans. And I did a little research. New Orleans is one of the largest ports in the world. And so, yeah, and it's because just it's at the mouth of the Mississippi. 
So I got this idea, this next series I do, be based upon ships. That whole idea of floating, and ships, journey, whatever. And I did a lot of different ships and boats as time went on. And they were hidden in the work somewhere, but they were there. there. And in fact, I wouldn't doubt if one of these three paintings was originally a black and white ship that I sanded down and painted over because, you know, I, I, I looked at it and said, I, I did that, but I want to take it somewhere else now. And these were available, and so I redid them. The thing that I love about this new series, especially the back wall, is that it feels very different than some of the stuff you've done before, but there's so many connections to your past work, including the ships, because there's a ship in one of the paintings there. It looks sort of like a little sailing ship. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. This was done kind of at the tail end of the pandemic, because we're still, like, when did the pandemic end? We're not really sure. But I think what I loved about the show is that my experience of the pandemic it was probably a lot of people's is like, we've never done this before. You're having to lean on what you've known from the past to get you through something you have no idea how to get through. And I felt like the process on these paintings were that sort of like, how do you create joy? How do you create a good life? When you're changing your circumstances, you're going through a difficult circumstance. You have to rely on some of the stuff that you've known in the past. And I don't think I really, I got that until I was in the studio and watched you make the two paintings that are are outside the gallery. They're just in that first room there, but they're similar to the ones on the back wall. Not the same series, but they're similar. You've talked a lot about working with your hands. And I think sometimes we underestimate how we can think with our hands more than our heads and how sometimes you can create a good future better with your hands or even a present better with your hands, let your hands do the thinking. And watching you work with a spray bowel, it's it's like calligraphic. It looks like a calligraphy master when Tom uses a spray bottle. It's unbelievable. Can you talk a little bit about the technique that you're using on the paintings on the back wall with the paper and that sort of technique? Mm-hmm. The Uncharted Water series, which in the gallery are the latest things I've done. I had finished some of these paintings, like uh, Mr. Lentz, the painting, the four drawings for Mr. Lentz were the last things like that I did. And I don't know how it started, but well, the first two aren't, they're still in Durham. But I just started experimenting with painting paper, flat surface, wetting the paper, and pressing the paper against the canvas, which was hanging on the wall. And these, uh, these are canvas, but it's canvas over a wood panel. So they become a surface which you could put pressure on. And these paintings became almost like monoprints. Because I wasn't using a brush to make these forms or shapes or these colors. I was brushing or somehow getting paint on pieces of paper that I'd wet medium on and put the paint on. Even make mixed colors on top of the piece of paper. I'd, then I'd get it and press it in, into the area onto that. And it would take a while to get a first layer on. And then it just keeps growing from there until you know, it begins to make sense visually. And in trying to you know, visually think about the weight of colors, the intensity of colors, and then those colors that you know you think are drab that don't come to life unless they're put you know, against intense colors, so that you know that became part of that process to make these particular paintings. In many ways, it's not very precise because a lot of mistakes can be made, but you can control some of it. Uh, to a certain extent. So it was a little bit liberating. I wanted to not just focus upon the technique of 90 degree and 45 degree angles. I wanted to, you know, see what else uh, could be done, you know, with my hands, because all of that is, all all of it is still working with your hands. And so I I found it very good exercise. Now I got to see what happens next. And that's part of it as well. I can't commit myself to doing another series like this because you just can't duplicate and so I'm interested to see what happens next it's going to build upon this work because I just did it and those techniques are in my head and and in my hands and it's very useful so I will see how it goes that's also what's exciting it's not doing uh, the same painting over and over again what's exciting to me is starting out with I know this sounds like a cliche but starting out with that blank canvas and seeing how it grows. I mean, I might have an idea how to start the painting off, but if it's going to have any meaning for me, it has to grow on its own as you're doing it.
and what holds it together are the, are the techniques or the approaches that I take to the painting at that time and the paint that I'm using, the paint that I might have stored over in a little jar over here <laughs> so that I have enough. It's all those things uh, that play a role. And part of that is working in the studio and making the studio work for you, you know, where you walk, you know, how, where are the tools that you need. But I have one tool I lose a lot, but I always find it. An old graphic design tool is just a very hard point, and I use it to do a lot of my marking with my scraffito, you know, drawing in wet paint. And if I don't have that, I'm, I'm up the creek. <laughs> so I try to make sure I have all the tools I need in front of me before I do something. Otherwise, the paint will dry. <laughs> yeah, the thing that I was struck by watching you make them is it reminded me of like a football game or a boxing match or something like that where you have an athlete who's really trained in certain drills and skills. If it's a boxer, you know, you know how to react and respond. The process of using paper and the water means you have to constantly respond to it. But that response is a trained, it's, it's a muscle memory response. You're not thinking about that response. You're just responding. Because I, I would watch your hands, like the thing would run a certain way and your hand would like almost like Kung Fu respond to the way it was dripping and spray the water another way which I'm sure you're not thinking through that, but that was what I was struck by watching. It was like the paint would drip and your hand would move. I could tell that that hand had moved that way for decades and just knew to go there. Does that make sense? Probably. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I understand that. I had, the idea of being able to make something is, is really important. Yeah. Questions? Anybody? The questions about teaching. I'm thinking about when I was um, teaching, and that's a question people always ask me. Uh, what did you teach? If I tell the truth, I have to say this, as little as possible. And that's true. I, I was always affiliated with institutions of higher education, but I really enjoyed being an administrator, either a gallery director or chair, believe it or not, um, you know, a teacher of art, because my role became supporting the people who did that very well. That was one thing I enjoyed. And then I enjoyed working with all of them together to make something new. And that was what was fun. As an administrator or a gallery director, being able to work with people to make something a little bit new and different and having students be at the center of it. So in that sense, I really value teaching and those people who can do it so very, very well. And I I you know, just want to see more of that. You mean like, yeah, yeah, that's what they are. In my studio, I have a table. It's an amalgam of different tables over the years, and I think I made them all. Their um, craftsmanship is sus suspicious to begin with. But they've come to a height, a standing height, so I work at them at standing, and it's a, it, one of the parts of this new table is it has its own drawing table on it, which has become more of a paint table now. These paintings never get much bigger than this, and so I can put them on that paint table and work on this like it's a drawing board. And so I can put my T-square right up against any of those edges to begin developing right angles or 45s or other angles. I can use my measuring devices to make everything centered or a particular distance from here to there, or create little areas of symmetry. Uh, I draw it out first with mechanical drawing tools, and so I have a line, and then I tape it off. And if you see a circle, well, how do you mask off? Well, you know, you have to sometimes cut the tape very thin so you can bend it, and then I might have put more tape around that, and then I rub it down, I burnish the tape down as hard as I can onto the painting surface. And then I seal that area with diluted gel medium. So it's like a milkshake consistency and I let it dry and then, I, then I'll paint or create another texture in that area. And so it's a very mechanical and methodical process, but it's the only way to achieve what I want to do because a lot of these paintings, I want that area to be very precise, almost like an object, 
uh, as opposed to being expressive. So the expression comes in the way where they are on the canvas in their relationship to one another. Since they are recognizable images, what relationship do you have to that little house or to that, I'm looking at the painting behind you, or to that boat or to that fish that looks like it's a weather vane? So, you know, all those things come into play. Watching you use a T-square was unbelievable. Uh, I don't know if you've ever, like, seen those movies from, like, the 40s or the 50s where you have, like, an airplane draftsman, like, doing those mechanical sketches fast with those T-squares. It's the same speed. He's like a wizard. Like, it's it's crazy how fast you are with a T-square. <laughs> yeah, we have a relationship to, you know, horizontal and vertical. And so, and in a lot of these paintings, I want it to be as horizontal as possible. Questions about responsiveness in painting. The idea of, of how you respond immediately to a painting and how part of it may be, you know, thought out carefully and crafted slowly. Sure, that's um, that changes the way you work. And that was part of what I was wanted to do, not, you know, in the moving to a new studio is to explore that once again. Because I'm sure at some point, I've been more immediate and responsive to making something than sometimes that many of these other paintings would suggest because they have to be thought out carefully. I mean, even if you're thinking it out from one step at a time, because none of these paintings were planned. I'm no, I'm no, I didn't do a sketch of this <laughs> before I started it. It grew organically as the painting grew. And this too was, was the case, except... You had to work more quickly. However, you, then you need to let it dry for a while before you go back. Otherwise, you're just muddying everything up so that you can create <coughs> some elements of uh, translucence and transparency so that the colors exist in a way that surprises me. So, Yeah, I, I understand. I, I agree with you. But you know, my appreciation for these grows as time goes on. Because I, too, felt, felt like this was just a very mechanical approach to doing something. But it's very much an expression of something else, too, that I begin to see. The painting that I'm looking at on the wall right here, I think that might be, is that study number one? That was a title I came up with because I thought it was a study. I was very close to sanding that down and painting over it because when I did it, it was very mechanical. And I finished it, and I looked at it, and I said, oh, this is crap. I said, because it's like an amalgam of every image I've ever used. And I said, why did I do that? I mean, but I've let it rest, and it's settled. And now that I look at it, I say, God, I'm glad I did that. Because it's something that grows on me as time goes on, and that's why it's a good idea not to destroy everything you do. The last paintings I did in the attic studio in Rock Hill, South Carolina, are represented by those three paintings titled I Rhyme. I think I did six of those, but those are three of them. I Rhyme comes from a term that a good friend of mine introduced me to. He was talking about boat builders in the eastern part of North Carolina. As you get out into the Outer Banks, but boat builders. And they t and talked about you know how they measured things. Uh, both, you know, the curve of the boat or whatever the case might be. They were beautiful objects in and of themselves. And he told me that they described that as I rhyme, which I thought was a beautiful term, I rhyme. It's kind of how you organize lines and shapes. And so, you know, that's where that title came from, I rhyme. And it's um, thinking about that, this thing that this, my friend had introduced me to. It just came out of the thin air. A lot of my paintings come out of thin air somewhere. Mr. Lentz taught mechanical drawing. I had already mentioned, I think, you know, I took mechanical and architectural drafting from, from Mr. Lentz. But I didn't tell you the other part. That's, I know that's what Kath is after. Mechanical drawing became so central to my identity in high school. And I at home, I had in my bedroom on the second floor of our house on Brumley Street, you know, I had my drawing table there in, in my bedroom, 
I, I got to have a bedroom by myself. And I hung Christmas lights on the bottom of it so I could turn it on when I was drawing so it lit up. And then my brother had left me all these uh, herringbone jackets, you know, like dress jackets with those leather pads on them, which I guess which were very popular at the time. So I took it upon myself to sew additional pockets on the inside of both sides, you know, like a pocket for a scale, pockets for triangles, pocket for, you know, your compass, pocket for a scumbag, you know. The, anyway, so you had all these little pockets. So what I love to do is walk down the halls of high school and just flash my tools. <laughs> so I, I think back on it. Damn, I mean, people must have thought that was strange. <laughs> But it, you know, it was important to me at the time. So yeah, that in retrospect, that really, you know, that whole idea of mechanical drawing stayed with me. You know, after high school, everybody goes to college, so you know, I, I didn't apply out there that much. I just you knew I'd figure out how to go to college. I ended up beginning my college career at, at Belmont Abbey College in Belmont, North Carolina, because my brother went there. You know, so I'd give that a shot. And, and in high school, when I was a senior, somehow somebody lent me a car so I could go there, spend the weekend there. I think it was stuck from there. And I thought, well, what will I be? And so I was kind of thinking maybe I could be an English professor because in high school I had a very interesting English professor. So that was one thought. So that was in my mind. But in freshman registration line, I found out that I could major in art, and that's what I did. I mean, literally, in freshman in the registration line, when they said that, I oh, I can do that, because um, you know I did other things too. That you know, I made a lot of signs. For some reason, I became a sign painter when I was in high school. I would do some signs uh, for the church, but also we decided that we needed a youth art center in Concord. And so these high school students got together and. You know, I remember going knocking on the back of Charlie Cannon's door, asking for money for the Youth Art Center. And so, yeah, somehow we got it going, and it was uh, in this old store and right downtown that maybe it had been a furniture store. So it had a lot of space, so you could create a dance hall and <laughs> do other stuff with it with the Youth Art Center. I made the sign for it, and it was a very elaborate sign because on a couple different levels, different panels, it was the Green Dragon. You know, I wish I had that sign now. Is that so, from yeah. Lord of the Rings? No, I have not. It just was because that's the problem in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> no, I, that's what I did. So I, the idea of majoring in art was pretty fascinating, and I was lucky enough to meet other students, even in that relatively small environment, who were very unique. And then I became interested in a lot of other things. I was born at such an age where your draft number meant a lot. I had a conscious objector status, so I was served two years, uh, which was pretty interesting. I worked um, at Guilford on the maintenance crew there. Of course, Guilford would accept people like me because it's a Quaker school. And then I finished it up at UNCG working on the maintenance crew there. And from there, the, a really great experience for me when I, before I went to graduate school was somehow I got a job in New Jersey at a, a wall accessory company that manufactured wall accessories for the furniture market. This was a semi shishi wall accessory manufacturing company because our major buyer was Bloomingdale's. And we always showed at their Coggin in High Point. It fooled me. But anyway, that experience was unique, and I value it more today than I did then because I had to learn how to make something that was going to be a prototype for the market. And that was part of my picture framing experience, but designs went further. And, and then what I enjoyed about my job, I would go down to High Point and hang the show. And I hung the show at Bloomingdale's on 59th Street and also Long Island. So I got to do that, which was kind of fun. Your mom ran a boarding house, right? Because I think that some of these feature houses and interior spaces, and mm -hmm. I feel like that is pertinent. I thought everyone grew up in a boarding house, but um, maybe not. It was pretty interesting. Well, it was a unique experience for sure. And I think some of my attitudes must have evolved from that. My mother would take in people that I said, think other folks wouldn't take in. We had a series of Cuban refugees 
in the early 60s, Hungarian refugees, a variety of different people who came and went, some of who you know, we stayed in touch with. And that was always pretty unique in, in and of itself. And some of the, my interiors reference that idea of rooms because we called the people who stayed with us rumors. Uh-huh. That's interesting. Now it's interesting. The rumors mm-hmm. up in the right-hand room or the left-hand room. So there were four, you know, four potential rooms upstairs that could be rented out, but I think my brother had one. So, um. Any final questions? Those are, I think the title of that series is, is Interiors, and it's trying to suggest a room or a corner of a room in the way that it's outlined, and then some other element, one other element on the quote-unquote back wall or whatever. And, you know, it's, it's not a real perspective. It's just an image in that particular format. So. Okay. Creating a space? That's my space. Now. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. That, and I, One thing that, well, we don't have examples of those, but I some used to use an awful lot of just black paint just black on white. I did an awful lot of that for a while, it seems, in retrospect. So I became very interested in that contrast. I do realize there has to be some element of contrast there. And the fact that 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 larger so-called white area is there, I think if I hadn't made use of the brush strokes, which allow the black to come back through, that wouldn't have as much depth. But to be honest with you, I wasn't thinking about that when I did it. I wasn't thinking, I mean, I consciously wasn't thinking about depth. I was just thinking about how will I make that area different than that. To, so it develops contrast, you know, that, which helps keep the line sharp. What, and one thing I, 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 you know, I say I don't use brush. I, I do use the brush a lot within a confined area. But I try to use it in a somewhat patterned way. I try to be conscious of how it's going the direction it's going in. Like, you know, I'm looking at that little painting back there. There's that, what looks like a table or a bench at the bottom of that painting. Mm -hmm. Those are just big brush strokes, but it's masked off so it doesn't capture the beginning. So it becomes more like a line and becomes a a texture within that area, which, uh, you know, sets the rest of the painting off as much as it can. Thank you guys for coming. We really appreciate you guys coming out. And Tom will be around to answer any other questions you have. He's not running away. But thank you, Tom, for giving us this beautiful show and, and being here with us today. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, and I forgot to mention one thing about this is crucial, and I hope it is recorded, is that when I was talking about the high school, I forgot to mention that it was the home of the marching spiders. All right. <laughs>